to reach the level of having these certain things, you're going to have to live like no one else will. So you can live like no one else can. Welcome to the On Purpose Investor Podcast with your host, Eric and Tiffany Vogel. We spent several hard years building a rental property portfolio so we could have more time with our family and live our ideal life. Finding your path can be difficult, so we're here to help guide you along the way with lessons, tips, and tricks to design and implement your dream life through real estate investing. Now sit back, turn up the volume, and get ready for this episode of the On Purpose Investor. Welcome back, Pathfinders, to show number four. Or today we're going to be talking about how is being cool worth being broke? And when we talk about being cool, we're talking about fitting in, being hip with the times, having the newest things, making sure when that iPhone 28 comes out, you're the first one with it. You waited in the camper overnight at the Best Buy to make sure you got it. But is being cool and having those new things, is it worth being broke? That's what we're going to talk about today. So we'll start out by talking about and asking, is it wise financially to make those decisions to have the newest things? A lot of people will get tired of their cars. Probably, if you Googled it, you might see that on average, people probably only keep their new cars two to four years, would be my guess. And when you have a new house, the average is probably, what, seven or eight years? Seven years. In a new house before you become tired with it. You get the itch that you want something new, you want something better, or you want something more compact. It's the human nature to grow tired of something. Most often when people go to get a new car, because maybe the new trim model came out, or maybe the body style changed on something, and you just got to have it. What people often do, and what I have absolutely done, was I just take my car to the dealership and trust that they're going to do me right, and give me a great value on my old car, and trade up into the new one. And what often happens there is, well, you're not just trading in your old car for a new one. You're rolling in some negative equity from that old car. You owe $20,000 still on your old Camaro, and you trade in for the new Camaro. But the problem is they're only going to give you the value of $15,000 for your old one. So now there's $5,000 left over that they are so happily going to just roll into the new one. And that's your negative equity. And it's easy to start a snowball in that direction. And then you decide you got that new Camaro and now you're a family person and you got to buy a Tahoe. And so, so you can fit all your kids in the back. And so you trade in that Camaro for the Tahoe and now you're $10,000 upside down. And it's just so easy to get caught up in that snowball of trading in, rolling negative equity just to stay cool. Sometimes it's a necessity and you have to do it, but ask yourself, are you doing it to stay cool? Yeah, I think it boils down to the the motivation behind the purchase. We had a child recently, and I am looking forward to my minivan. And I know some people are vehemently against them, but I feel like car doors and kids, if it slides, I got a much less chance of having to pay someone for a, a ding door in the parking lot. So minivan is on my top list of our, our big next purchase. But I'm not going to trade in my Corolla at this time. We have one son, and he fits in my car perfectly fine. The big struggles when we want to go somewhere with the son and the dog. We've got a 50-pound German Shepherd Lab mutt, and he pretty much sits on top of the baby in the back seat, and it turns into a, a love fest of doggy kisses. But At this point, we can make do with what we have. It's not very often that we take both the dog and the baby in my car. We've got Roman in Eric's car, and it's something I want, but it's not something I need right now. And we have other things that we want more for our family and our life. And a lot of that's focusing on travel and experiencing other things. So for now, we're going to stay with the, the Corolla ride it out a little bit longer. And in time, yeah, I will upgrade and get my my minivan, but it's not something that's going to happen probably until we have another kid because that's when it really will become a true necessity. So you'll say that your decision to get the minivan is coming solely on utility and not appearance. Right. Yeah. I think if we have two kids in the backseat of a Corolla, there's not really any room for me to take the dog if I need to take him to the vet. And a lot of times I do have to take him to the vet 45 minutes away from home, but it's five minutes from my mom's house. So I would take the kids, leave them with mom, 
take the dog to the vet, but it's not, there's no way for me to transport two kids and the dog that 40 minutes to mom. So at that point, I would either have to take your car and then you'd have to take mine, which is obviously not a big deal, but it would just be easier. And even still would not be a necessity at that point, but it would be something I want. And at that point, the need would be big enough for me to be willing to spend the extra money to trade in my car. Would you say that people want to buy these new things for an appearance factor? I don't know. Why did you want to buy these things? Like oh, your I, Camaro. I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be that new teacher that was driving the Camaro. He's a cool, hip teacher. He's got a Camaro. Well, and they did think you were the cool, hip teacher. They talked about that car for years after you got rid of it. Yeah, I miss it still. Okay. But the thing is, it's I have accepted that what I have doesn't dictate who I am. I don't need a big, flashy, fancy car to say to people I don't know and don't care about that I am a someone. I want to matter to the people I care about, and I don't need things to matter to them. When it drives me into asking this posing question, when you do buy these things, when you get the new car, the newest iPhone, when you get the newest streaming service that comes out, who knows what's coming next, but are you jonesing for the newest things? Like the metaverse. Do you need to be in the metaverse like right now? Or are you willing to wait and see if it actually does anything? Or Right. And if you have enough money that you can throw money away and you wouldn't really miss it and you're willing to gamble on something, you know, investing in the metaverse might be something you want to do. I know nothing about the metaverse other than it reminds me of Ready Player One, which if it turns out to be that, I would absolutely invest in the metaverse. <laughs> Did you learn nothing from that book? No, I don't think so. <laughs> are, are you jonesing for these newest things or are you needing them? What I want to talk first about is how to avoid getting trapped in the jonesing system. And here's how I have personally done it. So instead of buying a new truck when I had a truck, I wanted so bad to buy a new truck. All the time, I would see the newest Toyota Tundra come out. Oh, man, that, that thing is awesome. I really want that new truck. But my truck was paid off, and it was very old, <laughs> and it had a lot of dings, and it wasn't as capable as the new ones. But it did what I needed it to do. Its utility was to haul things, to pull trailers, to get things to job sites and whatnot, and it did its job. But I wanted a new one so bad. So what I do, I repurposed it. I gave it a new look for myself. I wanted something new just to feel like I was in something new. So I put new car seat uh, covers on it. I put a new steering wheel cover on it. I upgraded the radio. And I put this four or $500 into my truck that made it feel new to me. And because it made it feel new to me, I satisfied that urge to get something new. But I also had to have a conversation with myself. If I buy this new truck, Am I really going to be using it to its maximum potential? And I didn't think I would. So I never bought that new truck. And then later on, about six months to a year after I did all those upgrades to my truck, made it new, Tiffany and I had a change in our life that I was not going to be working on job sites anymore. I had made a purposeful decision after uh, Tiffany and I talked about our vision and where we were headed and where we were going that I didn't need to be at those job sites anymore. I didn't need to be the one picking up lumber. I didn't need to be pulling those trailers. I needed to be focusing on writing our book. I needed to focus on this podcasting. I needed to focus on our family more because this is uh, the time we made that decision is when our son was born, a little before that, actually. And that decision drove me to sell the truck and buy something more family focus, something I would enjoy that could not haul big materials, could not haul a trailer. And so I went with a Honda CRV. And that was a perfect utility vehicle for me because I, I play in a, a band at church and I play in the army band. So I needed to be able to carry equipment here and there for my music stuff. So it would fit a tuba, it'll fit a guitar. I think it could even fit a drum set, but it's not going to be pulling tons of stuff to job sites. Except when you put trim on the roof and are so excited in front of Home Depot, ratchet strapping some trim to the roof of your CRV. So when I built out the podcast studio here at our house, I did, in fact, do all of that work myself. It was a passion project for me. 
And I had to get sheetrock here. I had to get trim and doors. And so, yeah, I uh, could easily have been spotted in front of the Lowe's ratchet strapping materials to the roof of my CRV. (laughs) Going back to what you were saying about the shift we had from you really working in the rentals, I want to give a lot of credit to the book Who Not How by Dan Sullivan and Ben Hardy. That really shifted our mindset into for us to pursue the things in life that we want, we have to be willing to find the who's to fix the things in our properties and not having us doing it. Eric does still swing the hammer a little bit on projects around the house, especially because it's what he enjoys. But we really have shifted from doing the work ourselves to having someone else do it. Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to uh, talking about how not to Jones. We talked about the truck and repurposing it, giving it a new look. So it's very easy to get caught up in the cell phone craze, the newest phones coming out, all this fun stuff that's happening. Yeah, I've been wanting the new Google Pixel 6, but I have the Google Pixel 4. And my wife has reminded me, hey, it still works. You're good. Her phone is like on its last leg. And we finally said, okay, time for you to get a new one. I think hers is three or four years old. Mine's only two years old. So it's only fair that she gets the upgrade to the Google 6. So I'll enjoy it from a distance. But instead of getting those new phones every time one rolls out, ask yourself, is the utility of that item being utilized? And is it functional? So give your phone a new look. Re-image it, repurpose it. Do something to make it fun again. So the easiest way you can do that, buy a $25 case, maybe get a new car mount for your phone. Make it do something new, exciting to repurpose it. Instead of spending that $1,000 for a new phone, spend 20 to 30 bucks and give it a new look. So that's why you just got a new phone case. (laughs) That is exactly why I got a new phone case. I try to practice what I preach. (laughs) I think at the end of the day, it all comes down to the motivation and why you are making the decisions and purchases that you are. Are you masking frustration and pain in your life by having these things? Is it something that you think will make you liked by other people? There's really digging into the motivation behind it. Will buying this thing really bring you joy? And is it something you really want? Does it help you achieve your why and push you on your path that, to achieve the bigger things in life? Or is it something that you're buying to make your path easier? So it's going to help you reach your why. But if the the purchase is just to impress someone or give you that temporary satisfaction, but it's not one of your top 10 things or something that will really help you reach your goals, you should really consider is it worth spending that money, especially if you're going to wind up going into debt to buy it. So We did some research and found the average credit card balance is $6,200. And if you made the minimum payment of $250 a month with a 20% interest rate, which I think is pretty generous, you would be looking at 12 and a half years to pay off that credit card and $4,300 in interest. You would pay $4,000 in interest. That is just mind boggling to me. If you could take that approach and instead save up $250 a month for two years, You could have that $6,200 in two years and you wouldn't be paying it off for another 10 and a half years. Yeah, you might not get that thing today, but in two years, you'll appreciate it a lot more. You've worked really hard. You'll ensure that the thing you're buying is something you really want because if you're willing to work and save for two years, you're definitely going to want it by then. And you'll save $4,300 in interest. It's just mind boggling. Well, I mean, I think something Tiffany's not accounting for is the crazy inflation in America right now. So that buying power of $6,200 in two years might really be a little less. So go ahead and chunk back another $10 extra each month. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Going down a rabbit hole. There we go. At the end of the day, being able to save for two years versus paying off a debt for 12 and a half years. It's Yeah, absolutely. Something that I see just in general, when I was in... In the teaching field, what I saw a lot of from kids was comparing to each other. Do you have the the newest clothes? And I saw this when I was in high school. Are you wearing Abercrombie and Fitch or are you wearing Faded Glory, which was, I think, the Kmart special? That's what I wore. But I always wanted to wear Abercrombie because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be cool. But my parents couldn't afford it, and that's okay. I admire that they kept us clothed and fed. 
So they met, we met the necessity of it. The utility was achieved. So delayed gratification is something that I think we can all really steer toward. The world of instant gratification that we live in is crippling. When we want to watch a certain show, we just pull up Netflix and turn it on. Long gone are the days that you sit in front of the TV and watch commercials after commercials after reruns of The Brady Bunch and, and other shows just to get to the show that you want to watch. Now it's a world of instant gratification. You, you Google it, you can YouTube things. Everything we want can be right in front of us without waiting. And we don't work hard for a lot of things like nope. they did in the past. If you think about right now, I've got clothes in the washing machine in the house. In the past, you would have to sit there and scrub and get your hands all uh, wrinkly and nasty washing clothes and then go hang them on the line and wait for them to dry that way. Now I take two seconds to throw it in the wash, push a few buttons on the washing machine, throw some soap in, and 30, 45 minutes later, I have clean clothes. And then I throw them in a dryer and I complain about having to fold the laundry. But the amount of work that we have to put into our day-to-day life has significantly decreased. And we're so used to the ease of some things and having the free time to sit down and watch TV that... That we just do it. We become absent-minded. We will just sit in front of that TV and, and watch it. Yeah. So delayed gratification on this item that costs the $6,200, are you going to be able to wait two years to have it? What we see in general is that people are so willing to pay insane amounts of money for instant gratification. They want that item now, so they're going to spend that $6,200 now, and they're willing to pay $4,300 over the next 12 years, 10 years to have it. It is insane. And to put it in more realistic terms, a four-wheeler probably costs $6,000. People are willing to go spend that money on that four-wheeler, which they'll probably enjoy for three to four years and then get tired of it or it'll break and stop working. But the thing is, they're going to keep paying for that for the next eight years or so without even either having it or without it working or without them even enjoying it. Most consumer goods don't last. I mean, we talked about cell phones. Two years is the useful life on a cell phone. They seem to miraculously stop working really well at that two-year mark. Especially iPhones. I'm not saying anything bad against (laughs) Apple because I'm recording on an Apple device right now. It's GarageBand. They have great products, but there is these rumors and speculation and conspiracy theories that they upgrade you out of your devices. Right. So <laughs> let's say you you bought that iPhone and that's included in that $6,400 amount. After two years, it stops working. So you still have 10 and a half years that you're making payments on it. Just crazy. Just nuts to but think. But if you thought, <laughs> if you start saving for your phone as soon as you get a new one, and put that money away, you would have the money to buy one with cash in that two-year span. And then it would be, you wouldn't have to finance it and pay all that interest and pay for it 10 years after you're not using it. If we can just give delayed gratification a big hug and welcome it into our lives, I think the banks would be sorely upset. (laughs) We need a delayed gratification care bear. (laughs) Well, we're going to the Great Wolf Lodge and they have a -A Build-A-Bear workshop. So we'll go build a delayed gratification bear. Be on the lookout for our merch shop coming. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. So what do you do to be cool? In my life, I have found that being cool has nothing to do with what I have or what I do for other people or what I do to impress other people. It has nothing to do with anything. How I feel cool is what I think about what I'm building for my family, for our future children, our child now. That's what I feel makes me so cool. Because I think all this work that goes into delayed gratification of not having certain things now, that I mean, it can be painful to not have certain things. It can make your life more difficult to not have this utility item that would make your life a little easier here and there. But that delayed gratification, it can be tough, but I feel like it makes me so cool because it opened up the ability to buy certain things that will grow over the next 30, 40 years. And the things that I'm talking about are like investing in an IRA or investing in a rental or investing in something. That delayed gratification, it goes into your entire life from the span of when 
you're born essentially, or when you can start contributing to uh, an IRA or, or any type of savings account, it's delayed. It's severely delayed. I mean, of course, we're talking 60 something years until you can reap the rewards of that, of those investing. Now with rentals, the delayed gratification usually comes a lot sooner than a retirement account of sorts, because you can start capitalizing on the return of cash flow as soon as it's rented. But even over time, that gets sweeter too with the cost of, with rent growth, and with loan pay down, and eventually that house is paid off, and boom, you're making a lot more cash flow when that happens. Yeah, I think for us, working hard and delaying gratification and buying a lot of the things that we have wanted, and I mean, for example, your guitar. You had a Walmart special guitar. Oh, come on. It was a Fender CD60 CE retail of $200 back in 2006. It was I bought it with the very first paycheck I ever made working at a vet. And I was so proud of that. And we finally upgraded you. Well, yeah, I finally bought a new guitar. I now have a Taylor 714E. Very proud to have finally overcome the hurdle of delaying that. <laughs> <laughs> By waiting, you were able to get the guitar you wanted instead of having to go into a mid-tier. And we are financially able to make the, the purchase with no questions. And... We're able to continue living our lifestyle the way we have, where we're traveling once a month on trips. Mm -hmm. So by you delaying, in that one particular example, delaying the purchase of a guitar while we were investing, we were able to put that money into buying rentals and buying the assets that are now paying for our expenses. And the bank doesn't get to capitalize on our inability to delay gratification. Yes. <laughs> There's a, a hustle culture out there that gets you to where you want to be and be very cool, in my opinion. I don't know if that matters at all. This whole hustle culture is what I feel like can make you very cool. Not having certain things for a while, while you build up your empire, and then later reap the rewards of that hustle, that's what I feel makes you incredibly cool, personally. <laughs> There's almost, I think, a competition at times for who has the crappiest car in our circles. Oh, yes. In our circle, I mean, everyone we spend the most amount of time with in our investing circle, they're worth millions each, and they all drive $8,000 or less, some of them much less, <laughs> <laughs> uh, cars. And it's not about what you drive. It seems to be a commonality between people are wealthy or, or building wealth or reaching toward having wealth. There's a commonality of what is the utility of what I'm, ha what I'm buying? What is the utility of it? Is it serving a purpose? Is it good at serving that purpose? And if it is, so be it. I'm good with it. It all reminds me, one of our friend's daughters at high school, they had a spirit week. And one of the days was dress up like a millionaire. And she showed up in, I think, shorts and a t-shirt. And flip-flops. Yeah. And everyone else was in their suits and looking very professional. And it's comical because your typical millionaire, quote unquote typical, is generally not someone in a fancy suit with fancy cars. They're... The Neighbor Next Door, The Millionaire Next Door is a great book to give you some insight into the fact that there are millionaires out there who aren't dressing flashy. We were talking the other day. I think we were watching the Jim Millionaire. Joe Millionaire. Joe Millionaire. My garbage TV. <laughs> and they're saying, oh, this one guy's worth $10 million and this other guy is not. And uh, we just look at each other and say, you know, what benefit is there to, to advertising your worth like that? I don't know. Good TV. Well, yeah, I guess TV, bad TV. I don't know. It just doesn't sit right with me that someone's advertising that they're $10 million well, in net worth and that's how they're going to catch this girl. It's what know. is your worth? How do you define your worth? Is it in the, th the things that you have and that you're able to show people or is it something internal? And I think over the last few years, there's really been a shift of, in our life of not worrying about the things that we have. and. It's more about what we have in our hearts and how we spend our time. That's more important. Yeah. And if having the newest iPhone or the newest Android or the newest model of Camaro, uh, vehicle, whatever it is, if that's what truly motivates you and drives you and makes you happy and it's on your top 10 list, 
then delay that gratification until you can purchase those things without it affecting your daily life, without it affecting your ability to do the other things on your top 10. If you want to travel once a month, every month out of the year, but you can't because you have a car note or you can't because you have this uh, revolving debt or this consumer debt because you were trying to satisfy this culture of being cool. I think that's where you got to start drawing a line in the sand of what I'm going to push this out. I'm going to be okay with what I have. I'm going to push those things out for a little while while I really focus on my top 10. While I really focus on the other things in my top 10 that are going to create the freedom to enjoy the things that I like without it really affecting me. Yeah. The average new car payment is $570 a month. Oh, boy. If you think about if you had that kind of a car payment, could you afford to travel? Maybe not every month, but every other month. It's really, if travel is your priority, then buying a new car with a $570 monthly payment is not something you should do. Unless you're making $20,000 a month. Right, but (laughs) we're talking about the typical person. (laughs) And it all boils down to your priorities, what makes you happy, and your why. And if buying a new car with that monthly payment aligns with your values and your goals, then by all means, please go purchase the car. But if you're buying it to impress someone or to cover up insecurity or some other deep issue you have, it's not going to help you feel better. It might make you feel good for a few months but or maybe a few years, but most likely that feel good feeling is going to wear off before you're done paying for whatever that big purchase is. That's right. So I like to think that what you think is cool is probably what your friends think is cool too. What your friends have is probably what you're going to want to have. If all of your friends have the newest Tamagotchi that came out. Yeah, that's a throwback. When I was a kid, Tamagotchi was the big hip thing. And everybody had their little Tamagotchis. Yeah, let's explain for the the younger people what a Tamagotchi is. Explain it. Tamagotchi was the most (laughs) soul-sucking effort of a young child's life in the 90s and early 2000s. It was a little held hand game that was about the size of a computer mouse. It was an egg. It was in the shape of an egg. Yeah, the shape of an egg. And it was a pet. And you had to feed it and make sure it was sleeping and take care. It was like having a child. Maybe not quite as bad, but it took a lot of effort to make sure. And then you wake up and it's dead. It's so great. I killed my Tamagotchi. Yeah. Right. But so what I'm saying is if all your friends got the newest Tamagotchi, and you're still playing with your old Game Boy, and you're on stuck on level 10 of Zelda, but everyone's now moved on to Tamagotchi, you're probably going to want Tamagotchi, right? You're going to want it. I feel like this is <laughs> a terrible example. I think, no, I think it's great. Replace that whole segment with from Tamagotchi to Xbox, and I feel oh, like... <laughs> okay. okay. Every one of your friends are on Xbox One, and you still have Xbox 360. Okay. Does that feel better? Is that (laughs) what you felt when you got your new Xbox? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, my old Xbox, they they upgraded me out of it. I couldn't play anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Microsoft got me, just like Apple gets. Your circle is going to dictate, most often, what you feel like is cool. And are the friends in your circle, are they all chasing what each other have? Are they all jonesing for what each other have? Jim Rohn quoted and said, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Your network, who you spend the most time with, that's who you are most likely going to be like. If your circle is spending more time messing around and just going to Walmart and hanging out, or if your circle is all hustling in their day jobs and they watch football on every Saturday and that's what they live for. That's likely what you're going to be living for too. But if your circle is challenging themselves and, and hustling all the time and, and working hard to, to save or they're working hard to build a business and they're hustlers and they're focused on becoming the best version of themselves and they're always doing that, you're likely going to be inspired to do the same. So That's where I think your network becomes your net worth. Because if you're surrounding yourself with people that are hundred heirs, you're probably going to end up just being a hundred heir 
But if you surround yourself with millionaires, so long as you hang with that crowd and you absorb what that crowd is doing and, and you do it as well and challenge each other and you allow them to challenge you and you find ways to challenge them, you're going to become a millionaire too. Yeah. So how do you find those friends, those millionaire friends? So the way we found our friends, our, our newest friends <laughs> in, in real estate investing, which have now just become our friends in life, are we went to local meetups. We found one that was at an IHOP, <laughs> a little pancake house. And some of our closest friends are there. And we're going this week to see yeah. them. And we just love going there to see our friends and, and hearing about what's new in their investing careers and, and how things are going with them. Yeah. I think conferences also. We've made some lifelong friends on a cruise that we did right before COVID happened. Yeah. And we vacationed with them. We were supposed to be on a cruise next week with one of them. But unfortunately, the rise of COVID again has put a damper on that. But, Dang you, Omicron. <laughs> but we have built a network through our local meetup initially, and they recommended this cruise that we went on and then the conferences since then and trainings. And we've really built a network across the U.S., which makes it really easy to travel when you've got a place to stay in pretty much every state. Yeah, it's fun. But I just I guess what we're saying is try to find ways to surround yourself with people who are going to influence you to achieve your greatest right. and aren't in the, the hustle of trying to buy the latest and greatest and are focused on their goals and getting the most out of life. Right. So just when you come back to this episode or if you share this episode with other people, is being cool worth being broke? This is a phrase I came up with a couple months ago when we were thinking up ideas. Is it really cool to be broke? Yeah. It wasn't cool for me when I was broke. <laughs> <laughs> But I felt good sometimes. I got instant gratification of driving that Camaro. I got instant gratification of having the newest cell phone, of being in a new house, of all these things that brought instant gratification. But it wasn't cool when the buyers are more set in. Would you rather have your Camaro and the newest phone and all of those things and still be teaching to pay for all of it? Or would you rather have the time flexibility that you have now and not have the latest and greatest? I will say I really enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed being a teacher. What I didn't enjoy was the time, the chains of time. Right. And so what I, I absolutely love teaching and I would have been okay paying for them you, by using my teaching salary. But what I wasn't okay with was not having that time flexibility, the time freedom. So yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. To add more context, in the month of October, every year, you worked Monday through Friday with your regular teaching, practice for two or three hours, probably four or five by the time you set up and tear down, every afternoon, Friday night games, Saturday. Sometimes we'd get home Friday night at 2 a.m. and be out at a competition rolling out of the high school at 7 a.m. and then get home at 11, 12 that night. So you had one day off that entire month. Right. So trading that life for the life you have now, but for a period we weren't able to buy the things that we wanted to buy. Right. We had to delay our gratification yeah. while we hustled. Right. While but we now, gave up a lot. Because we threw every penny into our business. Everything. And now we're able to reap the rewards of that and buy the nice tailor made guitar. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have any impact on our life. It was just a fun purchase. Right. But it took four years of insane hustle, yeah. of, of sacrifice, of not having. And it might be 10 years. I don't know what the, the timeline might be for you, but investing in yourself now can give you the ability to live a very rich and maybe frivolous life in the future. It just takes years of, it may not take years, but it just takes a period of time of sacrificing, not having the newest things, of not doing what everyone else is doing. Right. There's a great quote. Everyone says that Dave Ramsey said it first, but who really knows who said it first? But to live the life that no one else can, like the circle of your friends, to live a life that no one else can, you'll have to live no one else will. 
So, I mean, there's multiple ways you can say that. To steal another Dave Ramsey quote, we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Yeah. I think that boils down to making sure the purchase is aligned with your your values and your why. And your personal vision. Yeah. Right. And to reach the level of having these certain things, you're going to have to live like no one else will. So you can live like no one else can. Thanks, y'all, for hanging out with us and listening to us talk about is being cool worth being broke? How can you take the time you spent with us and make it worthwhile? Is it creating a savings plan for your next big purchase? Finding a meetup to grow your network or something else? Don't let the time you just invested go to waste. You only get one life, so live it purposefully. That's all we have for you today. See you next time. Are you ready to discover and build your dream life? Then it's time to become a Pathfinder. Head over to onpurposeinvestor.com and sign up for our newsletter to get tips and tricks to help you find your path and get the latest from our blog. If you haven't already, we'd really appreciate an honest review on your favorite podcast app. If you're enjoying this show, share it with friends, family, and fellow investors. See you next time at the On Purpose Investor Podcast.